start off riding a donkey. A little donkey called Seamus. And I used to lead him around the farm on the donkey every chance, every time I had a few moments. I was changing the donkey one day from one paddock to another and uh, I handed the halter to Richard and said, hold on for us to I close the gate behind me. And the donkey suddenly spotted some bullocks down the field that he had been with before. So he decided to join them. Before I could grab the halter, he was gone with Richard on his back. And he got the feeling of being loose and he started to buck and plunge and bucked Richard off. And uh, he, the only thing I did notice was that he rolled. So uh, he, got, he was a bit shook and he sat up and shook himself and he said, Daddy, Daddy, I fall off like a jockey. Only a romantic or a fool would read a future lifetime into the spectacle of a small kid hitting the deck from a donkey. But even the most untutored eye can see the familiar shape of the future champion as he rides his ponies. It is the portrait of an artist as a young lad, the future captain of the flagship. My father trained in Northern Ireland, um, near Malau, uh, from soon after I was born, uh, till I was about eight, eight years old. And I loved horses, uh, loved being around the yard, um, and, and just messing about with, with, with the ponies and the horses. George Dunwoody moved his racing mad family over to the matchless beauty of the Cotswolds when Richard was just eight. And needless to say, Tony, his pony, came too. These were the formative years. Pony club and hunting with the Beaufort. A superb grounding across some of the finest country a youngster with natural talent and not a nerve in his body could wish to tackle. He was a very bright child. Actually, he was a year younger than most of his classmates. And uh, conscientious, you know, really worked very hard. We were very pleased when he left and over school that his mother kept in touch with us. And uh, we heard from her and uh, followed his scholastic career. And we were delighted that he did so well. But uh, we were rather surprised that he didn't continue his education because he did very well in his own levels but he could have gone far in any profession. At school, he enjoyed rugby and cricket, but he was also no slouch in the classroom. Jockeys may have small bodies, but they don't all have small brains. Basically, I didn't want to become a vet because I'd, I got the riding bug. and All I wanted to be then was, was a jockey. I was riding out in Newmarket, I say every day of the holidays, gone through the O-levels and everything, and um, I felt I wanted, I wanted to get out of it. And out of it, he got. The Dunwoody clan moved to Newmarket where Richard, now in his early teens, rode out for the likes of Ben Hambry and Paul Kellaway. And it was Kellaway, no mean judge of a jockey, who thought enough of Richard to put him up on Donegal Prince before that tough customer won the Schweppes for Johnny Frankham. By now, Richard was ready to be blooded on the race course. And the man who helped bring that about was the noted hunting and racing man, Colin Nash. His first success, uh, was on this mare which I'm holding here now, Game Trust, in the in the Old Barks Members and Farmers race. And uh, he absolutely won that very well. And then we ran her at Cheltenham and he won there as well with twenty two runners in the in a novice hunter chase. Uh, it was the last race uh, of the evening meeting and uh, he won it really well and that really did give us a thrill and him and I think really did set him on the road to, to his um, 
success. Colin was a lovely man. He was a master of the, the old box, uh, Fox Hines. Superb person. Um, I rode a few, in, uh, first in Hunter Chases, I think, before I actually rode in Point of Points. Fell off a few, and uh, he always uh, let me off and come back with a smile, and it, it was a, a really smashing man to ride for. Now Mr. R. Dunwoody claiming seven, Richard was soon learning the ropes and rituals of the weighing room. He was still very much the unfinished article, but his style and strength had already caught some seriously expert eyes. Spring, end of February time, Fuel Davis had a desperate fall and was put out of action. And I had quite a few runners at Hereford at the, the March meeting. And I decided that I'd take a chance and let Richard ride some of them. And to my horror that day, because there's a lot of racing on that day, I think there's Haydock and there's Newbury and one, two other things. On that day, he got, I think, six, if not seven rides. There may have been seven races. And I thought, oh dear, I don't like the look of this. As usual, Forster's lugubrious pessimism was wide of the mark. From seven rides, Richard booted home four winners, a second and two thirds. Dunwoody was fast becoming a name for the racing public to conjure with. Most of a jump jockey's working life is spent slogging round the gaff tracks, often in the sort of weather that proves God has either got a sense of humour or a bit of a temper. But by 1985, Richard was already itching to test his mettle against the strongest competition, to start making an impact in the famous races and to play a part on the greatest stage of all, the Cheltenham Festival, those three days in March that shake and shape the jumping world. And that first notch on the festival belt is a crucial rite of passage. Everyone aspires to, to ride a Cheltenham Festival winner. And uh, it was a tremendous thrill that, that year to, to ride Von Trapp in the, in the Coral. Um, I think he'd been quite heavily gambled on as well. And uh, before the race, he'd actually clipped um, a hurdle on the sheep hurdle on the way, way out and left quite a nasty gash on his side. I remember trotting him around at the start thinking, well, you know, he might, he's even feeling this, he might be lame, we might have to pull him out. Um, the start, I think the vet had a look at him and gave him the okay. Then through the race, I was very lucky, I didn't get, I didn't get brought down. Paul Croucher fell right in front of me, the um, second last with a circuit to go, went straight over the top of him. I very nearly went out th the front door. I uh, got away with that. And uh, as it turned out, he was. He turned out to be a very easy winner. Gander is also making progress as they come down to the second last flight now. Bankers Benefit and Jim won it. Bankers Benefit is just second, probably ahead of Run Lee Run with Inda Melody, the finisher. Richard Dunwoody, as we've said, a star of the future, getting his first winner at the festival meeting. His first season as a professional. And by golly, this boy has had some mixed fortunes on this horse. He gave him a crashing ball here over fences, uh, Von Trapp did, on his 21st birthday. But he was able to go to the party that night. I should think he'll have a party tonight because there's only one winner in it. And a desperate... But if there was one horse who propelled Richard Dunwoody into the sporting headlines read by a wider public, it was West Tip. Tough and willing, he was a rising force among staying handicap chasers and just the right type to fulfil a dream held dear by Dunwoody since childhood. 
So it's West Tip and Canny Danny to the last, and they rise together. Then after this little pole there, Lana Ray after this. My ambition from the time I was probably four or five was to ride in the Grand National, never mind win it. As soon as television meant anything to me, it was the one event every year that had to be watched. You know, it's, it's just something in racing that's it's something totally different. You know, everyone watches it's a worldwide event. There's West Tip with Knocker Ward on his far side, Falloon on the near side. Scott. Last suspect, Mr. Snugfit's getting closer now. So they come to the one before Beaches. Rupertino over from in the end on the inside. Corbio towards the outside is West Tip. Then Grease Payne. He got close to it, but he shouldn't really have got as low as low as he did. And I've got pictures of him on the on the way down with his with his ears still pricked. Led by West Tip on the outside of Rupertino and Corbier. Corbier and West Tip together, and West Tip makes a mistake and is down. West Tip is down. That means Corbier. It was uh, totally devastating at the time. You thought uh, you have one chance of winning the national. You you might never get another one. But never is not a word to use when talking about the national, a race that defies all the rules. A year later, West Tip and R. Dunwoody were back to try and put the record straight. Running down to Beach a second time, the ghost of 12 months before must have rattled the old chain in Richard's brain. But the horse's execution of the famous fence was faultless. And with the canal turn behind them, Dunwoody and West Tip had just six horses between them and the most coveted prize in the book. On the inside, young driver towards the outside, Kilkula and Ballinacara lad is down and going to the last open ditch four from home. And it's Mononor from Classified, Kilkiller, and Young Driver, West Tip, Lazarevich, Northern Bay, and Sommelier. These tightly grouped, and they're clear of Broomy Bank, Little Polvia, then Grease Paint and Mr. Snugford, and a long way back to anything else. Fat Hot Friends being pulled up at the third last. Mononor and Classified from Kilkiller, Northern Bay, who hit it, West Tip, and then Lazarevich and Sommelier. Mononor is dropping. Back. Second, then comes Classified, then the Zarovich, and then Sommelier as they race down towards the final fence of the 1986 National. It's Young Driver from West Tip. Young Driver in the sheepskin noseband lands clear of West Tip in second. Classified is third, fourth is Sommelier. They're racing into the closing stages, and West Tip has come to take it up now as they race towards the elbow. It's West Tip and the youngest rider, Richard Dunwoody, from Young Driver on the near side. Classified is third, Sommelier fourth. West Tip over on the far side has the advantage from Young Driver. West Tip by two lengths from Young Driver. West Tip by three lengths from Young Driver. Young Driver's fighting back, but West Tip is going to hold him and win the national. And as they come to the line, West Tip has won the national. Young Driver is second. Classified is just third ahead of the fast finishing. Mr. Snuck fit four, Sommelier five. And behind them came... I don't think I watched the last two fences, really. Uh, I think I was on my knees. Gail, my daughter, beside us. I think we screamed blue murder from then on. And afterwards, I think we just burst out crying. Returning triumphant to the Aintree winner's enclosure, Richard was living the moment that illuminates every jump jockey's hopes. Among those to congratulate him as he weighed in was the familiar sheepskin coat clad figure of David Nicholson, to whom, following Peter Scudamore's departure, Dunwoody became stable jockey for the autumn of 1986. Richard was joining a yard going from strength to strength. The Duke had at last broken his festival duck earlier that year, and the first major target for Dunwoody was the Mackeson Gold Cup, for which the Condicut representative was the classy, very promising. Golden Friend and Little Bay, as they jump that on the inside, are fun. On the far side, very promising, very promising, going very strongly at the moment. Durham Edition has been pulled up, half freeze moved into third, Cathy's Lad is four, Little Bay is five. Golden Friend is six, very promising, landed in the lead there, very promising from our fun, half free, 
is still making progress in behind the leader. Kathy's lad is four, and Little Bay is delivering his challenge now as they race towards the final fence in the 27th running of the Mackerson Gold Cup, and very promising is in the lead from Half free, trying to establish chasing history. Over on the far side, very promising. On the near side, half free. It's very promising by a length from half free. The fall of there was half fun. Racing into the closing stages, half free on the near side, beginning to get up. Very promising on the far side. Very promising fighting back, and he's going to win it as they come to the line. Very promising has won it. Half free in second. Kathy's lad is just going to be third. High hopes were also held of Charter Party who had landed the 1986 Ritz Club Handicap Chase. He was beset by various niggles the following season and fell in the 1987 Gold Cup. However, Nicholson never lost faith in Charter Party, but he had not won for 21 months when he lined up in the 1988 Gainsborough Chase at Sandown, set to receive £17 from a certain Desert Orchid. Charter Party, was, he was a grand old horse, but uh, he did have his problems and um, in the end we had, had to retire him because of his navicular. Uh, he had jumping, we'd say jumping problems, but he was always had it in him to, to miss a fence th through a race. And uh, I remember Scoo getting a very bad fall on him at Ascot one day before I joined the art. Uh, he, al he was always inclined just to, to miss one and could make a, a bad mistake. And Charter Party storms clear. Charter Party's defeat of Desert Orchid brought him strongly into the Gold Cup picture, but he still had something to find. Ten years old, he was sent off ten to one, but those close to the yard knew the Duke had him absolutely at his peak. I felt he had a, had a great chance. I think um, not, not everyone thought, thought the same. Um, I always remember walking around the paddock bef beforehand and uh, the lads turned around to me and he said this horse hasn't taken a lame step all day and he's in great form and I think it shows what a training performance actually it, it, it was by, by David um, tremendous, he was never given enough credit for it to actually get that horse there spot on in the day it's Cabby's Clown, little Cabby's Clown in the lead from Charter Party under pressure in second, Bow Ranger in third, Kill Dymo making ground in four, five snap Sala. You can count the rest out of it. Two fences left to jump in the 1988 Gold Cup. Charter Party, the challenger now to Cabby's Clown. Cabby's Clown on the near side, Charter Party over on the far side. In third place is Bow Ranger, four snap Sala at the second last. Cabby's Clown and Charter Party touch down together. Bow Ranger jumped in third snap Charter four, Charter Party's taking it up over on the far side. It's Charter Party by a length and a half from Cavie's Clown at the final fence. Charter Party lands in the lead. Cavie's Clown second. Bow Ranger jumps in third, waiting into the final 150 yards. Charter Party is going to win it for David Nicholson. Charter Party's striding away now from Cavie's Clown and at the line. Charter Party wins the 1988 Gold Cup from Cavie's Clown in second. Third will be Bow Ranger. It was the finest hour to date for both Dunwoody and the Duke. Victory in jumping's most prestigious event. Hard-faced, but not hard-hearted, Nicholson had endured a long wait before the Cheltenham Festival God smiled on him. But once he'd acquired the habit, he clearly enjoyed it and soon unleashed another chaser who was to become an enduring favorite with the Cheltenham public. Yeah, it's amazing how um, Waterloo Boy progressed. I remember when the, it was a two and a half mile novice hurdle in Maidor, um, really s slogged it out and uh, very gutsy performance. But he wasn't an exceptional horse as, as an, a novice hurdle. He'd been beaten round, round Taunton. Um, then the, his novice chase season, his first race was in a handicap. I think he was only rated about 80, between 80 and 90. And uh, he won a, I think I got up and won a short head at Worcester, beating the horse of Nicky Henderson's called the claim. But he, he certainly took the fences. He always jumped very, very well. And um, he progressed a lot through that through that first season, culminating in the, the Arkle chase at, at Cheltenham. on the far side, Southern Minstrel, finishing strongly on the near side. Waterloo Boy lands in the lead. It's Waterloo Boy from Southern Minstrel. Waterloo Boy, Southern Minstrel, Southern Minstrel, looks beat over on the far side. Waterloo Boy from Southern Minstrel is a race up towards the line. Southern Minstrel is challenging again, but Waterloo Boy is just holding him at the line. Waterloo Boy has won it from Southern And if there's any justice, 
then before too long Richard Dunwoody will be champion jockey increasingly Dunwoody was becoming the man picking up those all-important top quality spare rides for trainers wanting the best it became a question of when in doubt seek Richard out and Michael Stout did just that putting him up on the inexperienced Cribensis in the Triumph Hurdle. Strongly Chatham in the lead though as they swing round the home turn. It's Chatham with the advantage now from Cribensis coming there very strongly on the stand side. Chatham the leader from Cribensis, then Chatham, then Wahiba making very good ground. As they come down towards the final flight, Chatham on the far side, Crebensis really motoring in the centre, Wahiba in third place. These three have the Daily Express triumph between them. Crebensis is going to land in the lead. Crebensis lands in the lead at the last. Wahiba is second on the near side. It's Crebensis from Wahiba as they race into the closing stages. Crebensis on the far side, Wahiba on the near side. Crebensis is going to win this for Sheikh Mohammed and Michael Stout. He comes to the line with a three-length advantage and going away now. Crebensis has won the Daily Express Triumph. Second. Typical of the plums he began to pick was Grey Salute who under Dunwoody's guidance overturned the public gamble Vicario de Bray in the 1989 Tote Gold Trophy at Newbury. Vicario de Bray, then comes Cashew King in third, racing up towards the line. It's Grey Salute from Vicario de Bray, and Grey Salute is going to hold the favourite and win the Tote Gold Trophy, and up the line, Grey Salute is the winner. Yes, it's amazing how something always rescues the handicappers on these occasions. The good ground was a little bit against Vicario de Bray, but he may have just gone over the top, but full marks to Grey Salute, his trainer John Jenkins and jockey Richard Dunwoody. Very decent horses, though Crebensis and Grey Salute were, they were just two greys. And this was the era of one grey, the grey, Desert Orchid. Undoubtedly one of the most popular chases of all time, and a horse it was always worth walking a mile or two in tight boots to watch in action. Trained by David Ellsworth and owned by the Burridge family he may have been, but by the end of the 80s, Desert Orchid was, to all intents and purposes, public property, something that was an extra burden for whoever was on top. There was a fair bit of pressure the first, first time I rode him at Wynn Canton. Um, I'd been down to school him, he'd been very, very keen. I think uh, Simon, he'd always been the same way, literally sort of took off over the four fences down at, or five fences down, down at Whitsbury. And uh, I remember all cantering him beforehand and uh, around the circular all weather. Um, and Brendan had warned me that he could get very keen around there and that uh, Elsie might uh, help me um, pull up. I was going around the ring and uh, just get it, drawing up to, to where he was standing he stood in the middle of the all-weather, stuck his uh, hand in his pocket and pulled out some polos, trying to get the old horse to, to switch off and, and, and pull up. I nearly ended up running him down. Dunwoody and Desert Orchid's major objective was the 1989. With King George number three under easing, it was on to Cheltenham. Twelve months on from the day he had sent the crowd into raptures with his courageous triumph in the mud over Yahoo. With the ground riding fast, he was sent off 11 to 10 on by his devoted public. Uh, the, the race had gone, gone very well on the first circuit. Um, jumped well, just bowled along nicely. But from about halfway, um, Kevin Minnie on uh, tennis spades had started to take me on and uh, actually headed me at the, the top of the hill. And uh, I then had to pull out, go round him. I felt Desert Orc was always a little bit better going right-handed than he was left-handed. It just tended to, to bear out a little bit. Um, we turned into the straight and, and Kevin actually then started to hang out and carried me a bit wider than I wanted to, to go. And while we've done that, um, Graham McCourt and Norton's coin have, uh, have nipped up the inner and have got a great run from the second last to the last. Desert Orc is back in third place and he's beat. It's Toby Tobias and Norton's coin is away. Considering that the build-up to, to that year's Gold Cup, um, I think Mr. Ellsworth and, and the owners were, were superb after the race. I was, what, I was beaten two and a half, three lengths, um, but they all took it very, very well.
as well. I was probably more as disappointed as, uh, as anyone. But Dunwoody didn't leave the festival empty-handed. Two days earlier, he had won the hurdling crown on Crebensis, who he had helped to make as a four-year-old and whose class did the rest in the champion. Coming down to the second last, Nomadic Way and Past Glories now at the second last. Past Glories and Nomadic Way as they round the home turn. Past Glories and Nomadic Way with Beach Road on the outside and Crevensis getting into contention. Nomadic Way has the advantage from Past Glories under pressure. Beach, Way, Beach Road is coming there towards the stand side. Crevensis over on the far side at the final flight. Beach Road on the near side. Crevensis on the far side. Past Glories right up with them. Racing into the closing stages. It's Crevensis on the far side. On the near side it's Beach Road. As they race up towards the line, Crevensis has the advantage. As they come to the line, Crevensis is going to win the champion hurdle. Crevensis has won it from Nomadic Way. Past Glories from third. No race loves a staying chaser more than the Irish. And following his Gold Cup third, Desert Orchid and Dunwoody travelled over to try and defy top weight in the Irish National. Fairy House gave him a hero's welcome and the Grey a hero's performance. However, he makes a terrible hash of the last and amazingly Richard Dunwoody wasn't perturbed. I said I wasn't worried going, going to last. He, he was a bit tired, so I wasn't going, going to ask him any stupid questions at it. And, um, you know, he's fiddled his way over. He's given it a bit of a climb. The finish. The leader, Desert Orchid, clear from Miskins River. They're all struggling behind them. An untidy jump at the last, but he's putting up a good performance and getting a tremendous reception from the crowd. Desert Orchid pushed out hands and heels. Richard Dunwoody, the favourite, wins the Irish National. Desert Orchid clear a good 10, 12 lengths to the good of the line. Barney Burnett goes second. Desert Orchid therefore joins a very select band that includes Arkell and Brown Lad being the only horses to successfully carry over 12 stone to victory in the Irish National. But of course it could have been so different when Desi completely missed that last fence. So, health and weather permitting, we're going to be treated to one more season of Desi mania. His win in the Irish National had proved his tremendous resilience, bouncing back from defeat in the Cheltenham Gold Cup to totally outclass his Irish rivals. By 1990, with three King George trophies already on the sideboard, Desert Orchid's Christmas message to punters was drawing bigger crowds to Kempton than the Pope ever rustled up for his broadcast in St. Peter's Square. <laughs> now 26, Dunwood have won two King Georges, a champion hurdle, a gold cup and a grand national. He'd ridden the best to win the best. But now he started to scratch that itch that afflicts all the great jockeys, the desire to be champion. He began to drive himself even harder, adding a retainer with Nick Henderson to his duties for the Duke. He was setting off on what was to prove the road to glory, but a hard and rocky road that exacted a high price. It was always a, a great ambition. Sort of once I got up, up there and ridden sort of 100 winners. Um, I really wanted to be champion jockey. It, uh, it meant a lot more than anything else to me. The first major strike for Henderson came with Remittance Man in the 1991 Arkle Trophy. Horse and jockey were a class double act. When they write the textbook on jumping fences at speed, Richard Dunwoody and Remittance Man will have a chapter to themselves. It is just one of those things that when Remittance Man won the 1992 Queen Mother Champion chase, Jamie Osborne was in the saddle, Richard having been claimed to ride third-placed Waterloo Boy. He wins the Arkle from in second place Uncle Ernie, Redundant Pal, and then Devil Valley. Yeah, it's a brilliant display, this, and he's probably as quick over his fences as any horse we've seen steeplechasing. Second last, Captain Dibble made a blunder at it. He's clear in second place, so Armagh grits about five lengths away in third. As they race on towards the last, the odds on the favourite remittance man coming down to it in the lead. He's got six lengths to lead as he jumps it safely from Captain Dibble in second place. Armagh Gret takes it third, Mighty Fork and fourth, and on the run in, remittance man being pushed out hands and heels. He's going further and further clear. Victor in tremendous start for remittance man. He's got about 10, 12 lengths clear. Captain Dibble. Ooh. Ooh.
With a double handful of two top yards, Richard looked to be travelling well. But by now, the pressures were increasing inexorably. The pressure to be the best, as when getting Waterloo Boy home against Jamie Osborne and Young Snugbit in the Victor Chandler at Ascot. The faller there is good for a laugh. Heavy fall two and Shaw Metal continuing on for third. A two-horse war with one to jump. Young Snugfit on the inside of Waterloo Boy. They're, they're fighting it out. Nip and tuck as they come towards the last now. Young Snugfit and Waterloo Boy. Waterloo Boy and Young Snugfit. They settle down to fight it out now with 100 yards to go. Waterloo Boy on the outside. Forges a neck in front. Now a half length and he's drawing away. It's Waterloo Boy who goes on to win the Victor Chandler. Young Snugfit uh, gallant in defeat second a long gap then of about 30 35 lengths to shore medal the pressure to win the big races as on Morley Street at Aintree when he added a little unnecessary pressure of his own by going for home too soon and perhaps Morley Street's getting a bit wise in his old age but he certainly doesn't try after he gets his head in front Forest Sun way back in third, then Bank View. Now they've still got a furlong to go, and Morley Street can dot in front. Minaret's Girl hasn't given in. It's Morley Street dying here. Minaret's Girl is coming again down the outside. Morley Street only a half length to Minaret's Girl. Will the post come in time for Morley Street? It does. Morley Street from Minaret's Girl. The pressure to dethrone reigning champion Peter Scudamore here getting the wrong end of the argument between full brothers Morley Street and future champion hurdler Granville again. So risky. They're on the rise up towards the line and Morley Street now on the outside comes to take it up from Granville again. It's the two full brothers locked together. Morley Street going on. Morley Street showing the better turn of foot. Morley Street wins it. Completes a double for Michael Jackson and Toby Morley. Granville again is second. The pressure of handling the highs and the lows. It was a terrible blow to, to lose Mighty Mogul. He was favourite for the champion hurdle. His effort in the, in the Christmas hurdle was around the course we, we all thought was too sharp for him. He'd been winning over two and a half miles as well. And uh, you know, that was a great performance. And it was a, a terrible blow to lose him. Within six weeks of his vastly promising Kempton victory at Christmas, the horse is dead following an operation for a leg problem. The pressure exerted by the constant danger of riding jumpers for a living. Here, Dunwoody has his head down riding a finish on tug of war at Ludlow. A few inches more either way, and the following day's papers could have carried his obituary. That's pressure. The pressure to maintain his lead over Peter Scudamore in the jockey's title until April 11th, 1993, the day when Skew suddenly announced that his rides at Ascot that afternoon were to be his last. We'd heard rumours that he might retire, but I think I was in front, 10 maybe in front, but I always felt that with Martin behind him that he, he could get back to me. So there was a lot of, hell of a lot of pressure on. I was putting a lot of pressure on myself at that time. And uh, the morning Skew retired, or I heard it on the radio. I, said, I, I could not believe it. I was totally stunned. And it didn't, didn't half hit me. It was a total release of pressure. I have to say, I actually cried. I could, could, just could not believe it. Um, and not in elation, but more just a complete release of, of pressure. Skudamore's departure from the game he had long graced left Dunwoody as champion and a situation vacant sign over the door at Martin Pipes. The pipe job had yielded Skudamore six of the previous eight championships and was clearly a direct route to more titles for Dunwoody. Yet he had a whole raft of class horses available to him at Nicholson's and Henderson's. All three trainers needed firm commitments from a top class jockey, but you can't please all the people all of the time. On May 3rd, keen to have the best available arrangement firmly in place, David Nicholson announced the appointment of Adrian Maguire as retained jockey at Jack Dawes Castle. Pipe supplied Dunwoody with 22 winners that month, thus clinching the relationship, and he accepted the pipe job at the end of the season. Pipe and Dunwoody were no strangers to each other. 
some two years before in 1991, Dunwoody had driven Pipes Aquilifer back up to beat Norton's Coyne in the Martell Cup at Aintree. They both look tired horses. They're going to jump it practically together. Norton's Coyne getting on top again from Aquilifer. Here's the last. Norton's Coyne just from Aquilifer but landed in a heap. They're on the run for home. Aquilifer nothing if not game. Fights back to get on top. Aquilifer wears Norton's Coyne's down. It's Aquilifer forging on from Norton's Coyne in second. Stay on track to Long Gap back in third. Also in 1991, Dunwoody had clashed for the first time in a major race with the rising sensation Adrian Maguire, getting the better of the argument when another Coral outgunned Torrenfield. But it was a forerunner of many battles to come between Dunwoody and Maguire, culminating in their titanic struggle for the jockey's title in the 1993-4 season, a war of attrition the unforgiving intensity of which was only exceeded by the degree to which it left both men in a state of physical exhaustion. Another coral, nothing it is. Another coral jest, another coral, and Richard Dunwoody from Torren Field with Sword Beach in the air. Sheer discipline means Dunwoody's fighting weight is around 10 stone 3, but it's a struggle to get any lower, and the battle with Maguire would test his fitness to the limit. The name Maguire was to become synonymous with Viking flagship, but that super tough sort took two flying steps up the ladder in the hands of Dunwoody. Viking flagship is as tough a horse as I've ever ridden. Um, rode him through, through his, his novice uh, career. Uh, we'd taken him to, to Punchestown. We'd, we'd taken him out of Cheltenham and uh, because of the ground and then taking Punchestown in one twice in, in the three days and put up two very good performances. In his second race at the meeting in good style, Viking flagship wins it. In second is Antonin and they're clear. No one should ever undercall the degree of commitment Dunwoody and Maguire brought to their title battle. The head-to-head -head boiled over into public controversy after the celebrated Warwick novice chase clash between Ramstar, ridden by Maguire, and Dunwoody on Castle Diamond. As they come down with two to jump, and coming to the second last, Ramstar, Castle Diamond, absolutely together. Don't tell the wife is about six back in third, chased by Don Valentino and a gap to Jolly Jaunt. Down to the 17th and final fence, and as they come to it, and Ramstar out jumped again by Castle Diamond on the inside. So Castle Diamond the far side. Riding as uncompromising a finish as you are likely to see, Maguire's use of the whip did not draw any censure from the local stewards, but caused a furore in the press. Eventually, Portman Square handed down a six-day ban. It was another incident illustrating the fervour with which the title fight was being contested, and Dunwoody himself was by no means immune to reaching flashpoint, as he did at Nottingham on the 1st of March. Uh, the Nottingham race, there was uh, so a little bit of a build-up to it. I think there were one or two little niggling moments leading up to that. There was once or twice when Adrian and myself, just in races, we, the, the pressure was being built up by the press at the time. And there, were, there were a couple of little niggly points before it. In that race, um, there was a stable mate of his, uh, Willie McFarland, uh, was riding it. And we went into the bottom bend at Nottingham. I was just on, on Willie's outer. Adrian was down the inner. He was shouting to, to Willie to let him let him up there. Um, of course, I um, race riding or whatever. You, I, I was trying to keep keep Willie in to stop Adrian get getting the run. Uh, we've turned into the straight. Um, I felt I was on the right line, the inside line. Uh, they were open hurdles. They were island hurdles. Uh, jumped the first one, the straight, and I wasn't actually as close to the inside. As I, I as I felt it was when I when I watched the film afterwards, I, I clear, clearly came off uh, a true line. Adrian appeared between the third last and the second last. Uh, felt he had, was taking a bit of a chance of going there, and moved across uh, his horse. I thought Mr. Genealogy at the last moment ducked out. There was a little bit of room, not a lot. And the Nottingham stewards liked it, not a lot. Dunwoody was found guilty of causing intentional interference. They threw the book at him and banned him for 14 days, including the festival. The press concluded that a brainstorm had cost Richard his title chance, and the bookies made Maguire a 5-2 to two on shot. Richard headed for the ski slopes, lay low, and plotted his return for the national. 
Maguire Road, Richard's intended national mount, Mini Homer, to finish seventh in the Gold Cup at Cheltenham. But a refreshed, recharged and resurgent Dunwoody was back on board at Aintree, while Maguire partnered favourite Moorcroft Boy. Going into the race, um, I felt Minnehoma had a, had a good chance of finishing fifth or sixth. I didn't actually believe he'd uh, a, a real good chance of, of winning it. I'd only ridden him once before, two and a half mile chase at uh, uh, Newbury, which he beat for his son. Then he'd run quite well with Adrian, Adrian Maguire. I'd ridden him while I was suspended at Cheltenham in the Gold Cup, finishing seventh or, seventh or eighth. Um, but I, I thought he had a, a good chance of finishing in the first six. In the race, it it went pretty well. Um, he pecked at the first beaches, um, but after those first five or six fences, I'd actually got a real good feel of them. In the same way that West Tip was very careful and could see danger before, probably before I could, uh, whether it was a loose horse or a horse on the floor. Uh, Minihome was much the same, very, very careful, very clever. And, uh, he would be looking after himself as well as as well as the person on top. And as they come to it, it's Riverside Boy who leads. Riverside Boy, the leader from Garrison Savannah. Um, just going down to the first fence, the second time, the loose horse has, uh, has actually stopped Jamie's horse, uh, Garrison Savannah, and um, that was probably the the worst moment of the race. Uh, could have easily um, been balked and and. Uh, and brought to a standstill there. Then it was a matter of, of the, the next fence under the big ditch of actually keeping my momentum because I was left in front. I didn't really want to be there. And uh, he's got character. He doesn't like uh, being in front as, uh, you know, any longer than he, than he has to. And I was desperate for company down over those, those next couple of fences. And it was, um, in, a, in a way, I, I felt going, going to that... Uh, that ditch that he he wasn't too far off actually putting his toes in and, and uh, refusing but we got over that then we got a lead off uh, Ebony Jane I see saw just so heading down the beaches which I didn't expect at, at the time um, beaches very nearly brought us uh, to a standstill nearly brought us to the ground um, went down on on one knee but within a stride, he was back up and, and galloping. On the inside, mistake by Ebony J. The fellow's getting tired. Then follows Warcraft Boy from into the red. A long gap to Fiddler's Pike is dropping back now. Passed by uh, Russ Never Sleeps, then Mr. Red. Zena's land behind them, a long gap to Rock the Brand, so they're the only ones continuing. And the canal turn the final time. It's Vinnie Homer who led over it now. And it's the fellow who's gone. for Mini Homer from just so on the inside, Ebony Jane on the outside. Then back in fourth is Morcock Boy, fifth into the red, six is Fiddler's Pike as they jump the third last. And Mini Homer out jumped by Ebony Jane. Adrian joined us, joined the group, just crossing the Melling Road and looked to be travelling very, very easily. Um, I thought at the, at the time that he you know, had travelled so well through the race. Um, felt whether I'd actually get the the last sort of half a mile um, that was the, the doubt in my mind and the way Adrian appeared to be travelling at that stage I hadn't seen him earlier on um, from the canal turn but the, the way he seemed to be travelling at that stage I thought he was probably on the certain, certain winner Ebony Jane with a fraction advantage from just so over on the far side as we see them on the near side more prop boy and Adrian Maguire coming there all the time Mini Homer still in contention and into the red is getting into it as well they come down and it's Moorcroft Boy and Adrian Maguire who come to it with many 
Vinnie Homer, Vinnie Homer and Moorcroft Boy, they land together. It's Vinnie Homer and Moorcroft Boy, Moorcroft Boy, Vinnie Homer, and then comes Ebony Chain, and then Chuck Seven into the red. Jumped the last. Uh, Adrian's gone two lengths quick and two lengths clear. The first stride of two, I was a little bit flat. Took took a little while to get away from the last. Um, and I've got halfway from the last to the elbow and then ended up running away. But then the loose horse, Young Hustler, as uh, I thought, well, I'll try and get a lead off him. Um, then he's ended up going to the stand side. And suddenly I see a head appear outside me. I thought that was the end of it. Coveted arena in national hunt racing, the winner's circle after the grand national. 30 fences, they jump together, this little horse who's risen to the risen to the challenge in great stuff. Dunwoody had also risen to the challenge by common consent riding a masterful race, coolly husbanding Minnie Homer's resources until the decisive thrust close home but he scaled greater heights over the closing eight weeks of the season, mercilessly gnawing away at Maguire's lead in the scrap for the jockey's title, forcing the issue right down to the wire and running out champion by 198 to 194. He was never more tired, but never more triumphant. But for all the satisfactions of a second title the following season, Dunwoody began to look a more and more driven man. Starved of a steady diet of big race wins, he was on a treadmill at Pipes, and the first news of his discontent began to be ground out by racing's rumour mill. And he was clearly burning on a short fuse. And another controversial incident, this time involving Luke Harvey at Utoxeter, landed him back in trouble with the stewards. It was interference, I feel. It was caused as much by Luke as, as by anyone who should, should have had the whole race course to come around me. So I'd purposely gone off the line of the track because I just had a feeling that Luke might try it again. Uh, I've gone off the line of the track on the very inside um, and I was surprised to see him arrive there again. It was hardly comparable to the stramash with Maguire at Nottingham the previous year, but the stewards banned him for 30 days. It was a heavy punishment and it hung heavy on him. He drew a depressing blank at the festival and increasingly dire in his dealings with those who knew him, the laughter appeared to have gone from his life. People wondered how much appetite he had left for the game. Almost the last chance to win one of the season's big prizes was Pipe's cash fleur in the Whitbread. Dunwoody duly did the business, but every Channel 4 viewer seeing his face at the post-race interview realised how high a price he was paying. Mr. Boston, two left to jump now in the Whitbread. Galstrom and Cashfleur. Cashfleur just nodded slightly. Here's Country Member on the near side. But Cashfleur goes for home in the Whitbread. Goes two lengths in front now of Country Member, who's under the whip. They come to the last now. Cashfleur landed two lengths clear. Country Member out after him, followed by Galstrom and further back is Cogent. But Richard Dunwoody gets the work now on Cashfleur. He gets a great response. This has been a great ride and a great win. Cashfleur goes on to win the Whitbread. Fred, second is country member, followed in third by Galstrom, then further back as Cogent fourth, followed by Mr. Boston fighting. And then tell us about the jockey, because Richard's had a sort of difficult year, obviously for all sorts of reasons. How does your relationship go with him? Richard got down to 10 stone one, which was very good. Um, he was always was going to ride. Uh, he, he said he was going to do 10 stone two in the wet bread. Right. It's very good. He got down to 10 stone one. You can just see his cheeks a little yes. bit. Uh, he's a little bit thin. I'm glad he did it, although he didn't need to. He won by four lengths, so it was good. Martin, thank you. Much. And here is Richard complete with the cheekbones, which is. <laughs> uh, 
quite a lean Richard Dunwoody we're seeing. A bit leaner than I was at the beginning of the week, anyway. I mean, this business of actually getting down as an athlete, how low can you get and be safe with it? I, um, we're lucky today in that we've only got the one ride at, uh, at Sandown and I can get down and, and do that way without feeling bad. It's not until now that it's really started to hit me. Um, through the race, I was lucky that he was always travelling. I was always able to sort of maintain that rhythm and he jumped superbly for me. Received by the champion, Richard Dunwoody. People like to say we had differences. I don't think we had any many more differences than every other uh, trainer jockey relationship. Myself and David Nixon had a few differences. Um, you know, there were one or two. Obviously, there there, there are going to be times when Martin. I'm not happy. I'm my my own fiercest critic anyway. And there were one or two times, certainly when Martin felt I might have won on a horse that I, you know, didn't do. Basically, there was a lot of pressure in the job. There's a lot of pressure on Martin from, from his owners. Um, he's got a lot of horses. He's got a lot of owners to keep happy. And um, I, I didn't feel from that point when I came back the, the, the end of February, beginning of March, that I really wanted to be in this onslaught of rushing up and down the country, uh, going everywhere, just to ride you know, just a ride, you know. It's, uh, win is, is uh, it was an obsession, and I, I felt I, di I didn't need it anymore. And um, I didn't feel I had the time to give to a, a big yard, to commit myself fully to a big yard. And if you're going to ride for Martin, you, you have to be fully committed. Word had it that Dunwoody had come desperately close to packing the whole game in. Clearly something had to give, and it was the pipe job. Dunwoody, with a new start in his professional and private lives, set out to rediscover the joys of being his old self. Riding for Edward O'Grady and picking and choosing as the most sought-after freelance, the winners began to flow, with O'Grady's sound man taking a high profile in the renaissance of a sportsman suddenly enjoying his talents again rather than being tortured by them. The storm alert being pushed along. Travado is pulling the stick. There are about six lengths to Viking flagship who hasn't made up any ground at all. At the second last, sound man the first to rise. It gets over at mistake by Travado. All but went there. They've got one fence left to jump. And it's sound man two and a half, three lengths in front now. Of storm alert is under the web. Coming towards the last now. Sound man draws to it, jumps it, and jumps it well. Lands four lengths in advance of storm alert, followed by Travado. A gap to Viking flagship. But on the run in for home, it's sound Sound Man is bounding away. Great performance. Richard Dunwoody in the saddle. Great ride. And Sound Man goes on to win the Tingle Creek in grand style. Second is Storm Alert. Third... From being a remote and lone figure, he suddenly became approachable again. People wanted to talk to him, and he began to relax and open up in response. He was clearly a man on good terms with himself. And just as they say fear travels down the reins, it's clear contentment does also and the horses were really running for him. I think you have to ride every race accordingly. And um, I don't think it's always essential to be going the shortest way. Um, you might want to keep out for the good ground. Um, I think some horses you, you'd get beat on if, if you went down the inside, took them in down the inside. They curl up on you and uh, they don't race for you. Show them a bit of light, pull them to the outer and they, they start to run. I think you've got to ride every race accordingly. It is this ability to ride each and every horse according to its needs that separates the great from the merely good. There are plenty of jockeys who race, and it's, I think it's very important to, to keep a rhythm through a race. This is the final fence. One man safely over. He's going to win the King George, the favourite. Over in second place, Muscular Curie, then Master Oates and Val Delane. They're followed by Young Hustler. A brave race by him, but it's one man. Victory on one man was superlative stuff and achieved without resort to the arts of persuasion. But Dunwoody can get serious with them when the outcome hangs in the balance, and inevitably he walks the knife edge of the steward's disapproval. On the whole, I think the... Um, the whip guidelines have, have certainly improved our riding. I think jockeys now are riding as well as they, they've ever been riding. Um, it can be very difficult. It's difficult for the stewards uh, to interpret. It's difficult for the jockeys. 
Um, there are going to be odd occasions when a horse isn't traveling, you've had to give him two or three slaps, then suddenly he starts to pick up for you, starts to respond. And um, you're giving him another, he responds that a little bit more, and then you get caught up in a close finish. And um, you've ended up exceeding the guidelines, um, really through n no fault of your own. But you're on a horse that's got every chance of winning. Down together, nothing between them. They clear a bookcase and further back, Albermine from Bimsey and Lonesome Train on the run in for home. A furlong to go. Chief Song the far side and Eskimo Nell followed then by bookcase. They race up towards the line. Chief Song. The arbitrariness of where the line is drawn in a head down driving finish is an occupational hazard for Dunwoody. Chief Song earned him four days. There's also little doubt that a horse hit by Dunwoody stays hit, and there are doubtless some who do not find it a pretty sight. But Dunwoody may be severe when necessary, he is never savage. The game is about winning, and he throws everything in to achieve that end without crossing over the boundaries into the unacceptable. As befits a man relaxed with himself, he enjoys racing in that country where everyone is pretty relaxed with just about everything. Ireland. I, I really enjoy the racing over here. It's still very competitive. And uh, less racing over here during, during the winter. There's only probably on average about three, three meetings a week. But uh, it's competitive. The good crowds, and very enthusiastic crowds as well. The Irish people are very welcoming. And, uh, you know, you, you usually have a good time. Examples of Dunwoody's excellence are legion, but because they don't make 24-hour long videos, we'll focus on three. He's a master around the big Aintree fences, and if you are writing the textbook on how they should be jumped, look no further than watching Dunwoody on the Antarctic. Rough Quest is a star, but like many a star, he has his ways about him. Dunwoody was wise to the quirks and got the required result. Right on the inside as they take that, and Egypt Mill Prince has come to join. Barton Bank between them is Rough Quest, who's travelling very well. Inside the final hundred yards, Egypt Mill Prince is tied in second place. Percy Smollett is flying. Rough Quest will have to watch out, but Rough Quest has just won the race. Then there was the day he surprised Old Docklands Express and his trainer at Aintree. The great thing about having done Woody on top, and I'm sorry for Norman, he's not here, so I'm sure he's on exactly the same. Um, but then when they don't listen to trainers' instructions, um, I said to him, whatever ever happened, he wasn't to take it up till after the last. It was wonderful to see the old horse enjoy himself. If he doesn't like going out in front at home, he's never really enjoyed being on his own. Um, and his old ears were going backwards and forwards, and I think it was a novel idea for him. And he kept enough up his sleeve to go and have enough there for if it was a challenge. And he enjoyed it. He really enjoyed it today. It was good. Second to Docklands was Graham Bradley on Black Humour. Brad, the jockey's jockey, is frank in his praise of his friend and rival. About as good as I've ever seen. Frank him apart. Um, I'm a great fan of John Frank, and I think he was the, the most natural horseman, brilliant jockeys I've, I've ever seen. But Richard's absolutely phenomenal. Very hard to beat, very dedicated, can't get up his inner. He wouldn't try to come up your inner. Um, he's just the professional jockey, I think. Uh, he's a natural horseman, he sees his stride very well. Um, he works very hard at it though, he's always time form books are always out, he's, he's a workaholic, riding out most mornings, he's as competitive now as he's ever been, um, and he's had a lot of trouble with his weight over the years as well, I mean to have a thousand rides and keep doing ten stone and ten one, you would have thought it would have took its toll a little, but the way he's riding this year is just absolutely unbelievable, as good as he's ever rode, and as good as I've ever seen. At the peak of his powers, Dunwoody arrived at Cheltenham for the 1996 meeting with a record to remedy. The two previous festivals have been a dispiriting drought, but he picked up the thread in the arkle for his old ally, Edward O'Grady. 
a gap of eight lengths then to inch K-Lock, Supercoin and Cable Beach is weakening badly, but one left to jump, Ventana Canyon is nicely clear. Ventana Canyon comes to the last now, takes off, jumps it well, and Ventana Canyon is home for all money. Six or eight lengths clear of Artie Kinsman, inch K-Lock, and further back is Supercoin, but on the run in it's Ventana Canyon. Kept going by Richard Dunwoody, his first for the Festival 96, but Ventana Canyon, driven out, goes on to win the Arkle in grand style. Wins by about 12 lengths. Artie and in the triumph hurdle, he stalked his way through the field on the thorough stayer Paddy's return. A classic matching of horse to course. Well, with the sheepskin nose round there, clear of Paddy's return. On the turn for home now in the triumph, a long run before they reach the last. Magical Lady strikes the front now from embellished behind them. Further back is Zabadi, Revion out wider, followed by Miss Stang, get in there, clear then of Asgard, Feig and Hatterbreeze running on. Magical Lady though takes it up and is hampered. Es uh, embellished there, who's a faller? Embellished is a faller there. It's Magical Lady though, the leader. Promised Miss Stang get as they come over the last. Paddy's return coming at the leader hard. Followed then by Hatterbreeze. A hundred yards left to go. Paddy's return takes it up now. Paddy's return goes a length and a half clear of Magical Lady. And in the run of the line, Paddy's return's going to win the triumph. Paddy's return goes on to win by... Untold numbers of horses set off for the destination of the Cheltenham Festival winners' enclosure. But only 20 arrive each season. No sound falls sweeter on a jockey's ear than the applause that greets a festival winner. Strangely, these famous races can blind you to the bigger picture. Dunwoody's ride on unguided missile at Ascot logged him a whole forest of superlatives. But as Peter Scudamore says, it is his mastery of the day-to-day -day that is a measure of his true merit. I suppose when I watch him ride, read about his achievements of, uh, and I always think that you know, we, we, we tend to go over the top that, that the race at Ascot that he got all his uh, accolades for because it was on television because it was a high profile race and you know, somebody says it was fantastic you know it, it, it rollerballs and everybody says uh, that win was marvellous but I, you know, I can watch him go around Stratford on a on a Thursday, and you know that nobody else is, you know, very few press are watching all this. And you, you can watch him perform some amazing feats. He'll go and win on horses that other people wouldn't win on, or he shouldn't win that to race. Time and time again, I will watch him do, do that. Whereas the Ascot race, to me, the horse made a few mistakes, and, uh, you know, it was magnificent. But uh, it, it's not what Richard and Woody is about. Richard and Woody is. is is about the consistency of, of going down the inner, staying, waiting, waiting till another jockey makes a mistake and then he's gone. Goes to rough quest. Everyone wants the acknowledgement of their peers and fellow professionals. And in 1996, for the fifth time in six years, his weighing room colleagues made Dunwoody jump jockey of the year at the annual Leicester's Awards ceremony. The winner is Richard Dunwoody. <laughs> But it's a big change from, you know, fighting for every winner all over the country to now spreading the load, isn't it? You, you're, your whole lifestyle has changed. It is, but, um, you know, that's the way I find it. Uh, we've changed it, we've put the weight up, and it's, you know, it's a lot, lot better way of life. And uh, I'd just like to say, I think, an evening like tonight, our, needs, our, our sport needs promoting. Uh, we're under pressure from the, from the lottery and the, the animal rights, especially the jump racing. I think a night like tonight really promotes the sport and it's just a pity we can't uh, take a night like this to the public. I think it's fantastic and just those films. Are, uh, Riding jumpers for a living is an unforgiving business that can break those it makes. Dunwoody has scaled virtually every height and has passed through a few fires on the way. But like tempered steel, the heat has forged him anew. Hardened but happy with the job, he is possessed of an endless appetite for more. A great who believes he can be greater still.